invite you now to join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, as we read the stories of the ancient church in Jerusalem from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit with us now as it was with them. We pray that you will inspire these words, that they may become for us a living word, calling us to discipleship, to caring, to sharing, to ministering in his name. Amen. Listen to scripture now as I read it to you from the fifth chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. Word of warning, I think this is one of the more difficult texts of the New Testament, but important nonetheless. But a man named Ananias, with the consent of his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property with his wife's knowledge, and he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Ananias, Peter asked, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain in your, remain your own? And after it was sold, were not the proceeds at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You did not lie to us, but to God. Now, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard it. And the young men came and wrapped up his body and then carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours... His wife came in, and not knowing what had happened, Peter said to her, Tell me whether you and your husband sold the land for such and such a price. She said, Yes, that was the price. And then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to put the Spirit of the Lord to test? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. And when the young men came in, they found her dead, so they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear seized the whole church and all who heard of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thank be you, to Lord. God. As I warned, it's one of the most troubling texts in the New Testament. It is seldom preached, if at all. It doesn't show up in the lectionary, and so even lectionary preachers who pride themselves on preaching the whole Bible usually avoid the text. And lucky you, you get to hear the second sermon that I've ever preached on it. I preached it last year, and will preach it again this year. Different sermon, though, not the same <laughs> one. But I think we need to examine this text closely, because I think it's one of the first stories about the early Christian community in Jerusalem. It's a story about the norms and the values that held that fragile community together after Jesus had died. Now, upon first hearing it, we might think that it is an account of what happens to people who are cheap or lack generosity. But that's not the case, I don't think. Rather, I believe it's a story about the values the early church played upon, pay, you know, placed upon the ministry of caring and sharing. And so I've got three points for you this morning. First, why should I care? Second, why should I share? And third, do we dare? Somehow they rhyme, too, don't they? <laughs> but can we be a caring, sharing, and, dis and daring disciples? Why should I care? The story of Ananias and Sapphira is not a story about the divine vengeance of God upon people who do not give generously. No. I believe the account was included in the book of Acts because it underscored the importance of caring and sharing to the early church. You see, the living body of Christ was no longer the, in Jesus who walked on the earth. It was now the resurrection community of the faithful. 
It was now that small group who gathered together in Jerusalem to worship. They gathered together regularly. And when they gathered, they sang, they worshiped. But most importantly, they found ways to support one another. You know, in the previous chapter, in Acts 4, right before this section, we read, there was not a needy person among them. For as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what they sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. That was the description of the early church. You see, their faith was not manifest in what they declared. It was not manifest in what they said. It was not manifest in some creed that they had written and read together. All these things would come later in the centuries to follow. No. Their faith in the living Christ, the Christ who is with them in the person of the Holy Spirit, their faith was in what they did and in how they lived. And so we read, they cared for each other. They shared what they had with each other. And there was not a needy person among them. Ananias and Sapphira were probably good people. You know, they might have been articulate. They could have been there every Sunday. They could have been strong believers. They might have showed up on Sundays, the Lord's Day, and worshipped with the community, singing the hymns, offering prayers. But they held back. They held back. They didn't care about the community enough to participate fully. Who knows why? We don't know their motivations, do we? We can only guess. But here's the thing. We know ours. We know ours. And so the question for us is, the question for me is, why should I care? Why should I care? Well, I think you should care. Because Poland Presbyterian Church is a wonderful community. I said it. It's not perfect. It's made up of imperfect people and imperfect clergy until now. (laughs) And each of us brings our quirks and our sins to this place. But we gather in God's name. Poland Presbyterian Church is a community that not only prays, but it works to discover ways to show the love of Christ to other members in the community of faith. You know, I'm amazed at the amount of care that goes on here. On Thursday afternoon, I met with a group of members who for the last 12 months have taken the list of shut-ins and homebound and have endeavored to visit each one of them monthly on behalf of the church. You know, this is an example of members reaching out to those who might not feel a part of the community simply because they cannot be here but reminding them with their presence that indeed they are. You should care because they care. You should care about Poland Presbyterian Church because it's a beacon that reflects the love of Christ well beyond these walls and well beyond our membership. Are you aware of the outreach in the Mahoning Valley that this congregation does? Are you? Salvation Army. Okay, I bet in a couple weeks, maybe next week even, Sally's going to be back from Israel and she's going to be, you know, recruiting, you know, 50, 100 ringers, right? And she will get them. And not merely because she's after us all the time, but because you are good enough to be willing to say yes. We care. But it's not just Salvation Army, it's Beatitude House, Habitat for Humanity, Hospice of the Valley, Meals on Wheels, Mission of Love, Needle's Eye, Southside Ministry, Ohio Valley Teen Challenge, Operation Learning Community Program, Poland Dry Pantry, Poland Interfaith Pantry, Protestant Family Service, Rescue Mission of Mahoning Valley, Ursuline Sisters HIV AIDS Ministry, plus, if that's not enough, we have our own Helping Hands Hotline. Did I forget something? 
I'm serious, did I? You know, those are the projects just in this area. And your financial support also reaches into the world, <clears throat> helping Syrian refugees in Lebanon. We responded with over $2,000 this year to help the Syrians there. Feeding hungry people in Central America, bringing clean water to villages in Africa, building homes in South America. And when I was a child, I enjoyed playing by the lake. I enjoyed throwing stones into the lake and then watching the ripples spread as I tossed my pebbles in. The stones were not large, but the ripples would literally spread for hundreds upon hundreds of feet, reaching well beyond the place where I tossed the stones. All those agencies and efforts that I just mentioned are in some way but a pebble in the great sea of need. But you need to know that what Poland Presbyterian Church does sends its ripples into the world, making a difference and sharing the light of Christ with others well beyond, well beyond this place. Why should I care? Oh my goodness. Because in this world, we need communities of faith that will model what Christ taught about goodness, grace, and love. We need communities of faith that will defiantly make a stand against the selfishness, the brutality, the bullying, the exploitation, and the malaise that characterizes our postmodern age. We need a community that will take time to teach our young not merely the knowledge of things seen, but of those things unseen. Also about the love of Christ, the power of the Spirit, and indeed the reality of evil, and their own capacity for both good and evil, and their need for Christ in their lives. Why should I care about Poland Presbyterian Church? I think each of you, can add a thousand additional reasons. Well, why should I share? Ananias and Sapphira did not share. They could not answer that question, why should I share? And so they held back. We lose something, something very real, very human, when we hold back from sharing. Why should I share? Let me give you three reasons. First, I think we need to sh we sh should share because we need to. And I love the moment for mission that Dave Reed just offered. He told us that he needs to give more than God needs his gift, and he's absolutely right about that. Our need to share is more important than what we share. Why? Because he needs Christ, and each of us needs Christ also. Each of us desires the experience of being part of something that is greater, something larger than us. You know, the heart desires some transcending purpose that makes sense of all the loose ends in life. I think sharing, genuine sharing, is the key to discovering this greater sense of self, this greater sense of purpose. Because it is in sharing that we discover and we receive the meaning of life. And in second, we should share because, well, it makes you feel good and it brings joy. There's nothing wrong with feeling good. I say this for certain. One of the greatest joys I know in life is sharing and giving. Nothing makes my heart feel better than when I can give something of myself, whether it's my time, my finances, or some object that I have. I can remember as a youth sitting in the next to the last row in the church in Second Reformed in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and hearing the stewardship sermons where we were implored to give until it hurt. Give until it hurts. That's not the message of Jesus. He calls us to share, not until it hurts, 
but until it feels good. I know we have a couple cross country runners in the room here. And you know, there is you know, a moment that the marathon runner or the cross country runner experiences. Some people call it the runner's high. But it's that exhilaration of investing all your physical energy in a race beyond the point of pain. You discover a sense of joy and a sense of exhilaration. I think the same thing happens to those who share. When we share beyond that point, I think we will feel the giver's high, that exhilaration from, that comes from knowing you made an impact. You are someone who is changing the world for the better. Finally, we should share because it's contagious. It's contagious. And this is a virus that this world needs. You know, Poland Presbyterian Church, I think, has experienced some of this contagion in a silly little way. In mid-August, the tomato plants that were planted outside my office began to produce a lot more tomatoes than I or Karen could eat. And so I didn't want them to go to waste. I put them in a basket, put them on a table, and said, help yourself to my tomatoes. Well, wouldn't you know it, someone else decides to bring vegetables, and then someone else decides to bring other vegetables, and then someone brings watermelon and squashes and peppers, and then some flowers begin to show up. All of a sudden, people are sharing at this incredible level, and no one asked them to. No one asked them to, they just did. Sharing is contagious. And here's the amazing thing. Now our deacons are looking at making this part of their programming. And if they do that, they're going to emulate the early Christian church, which gathered together and they brought all the goods that they have and they shared them so that others could have them. Sharing is contagious. My last point, do we dare? I want to conclude with a challenge. I want to dare Poland Presbyterian Church to be better stewards, more generous in your sharing, and more loving in your caring. I want to challenge you to dare to care and dare to share. In four weeks, there will be another face in this pulpit. Paul Anderson and his family will make some tremendous sacrifices to respond to God's call to be your pastor. I have responded to five different calls in my ministry, four with my wife Karen. And I will say that each one required daring on my part, sometimes foolish daring, and sacrifice on the part of my family. We've left homes we loved, neighbors we cared about, good schools, and for Karen, a good job. We had, to we, have, we had to be separated for nearly six months so that a house could sell because we couldn't handle two mortgages. That's the nature of ministry. And that's what happens when you extend a call to someone to serve you. Paul will be leaving a home of 17 years with his family. I know that they are looking forward to life among you and all the wonderful things about Poland and this community. But you also need to remember the daring nature of their decision. They're leaving the security of what they know so that they can minister among you. They've been living apart, selling a house, picking up stakes so that he may join you as your pastor. I've grown to love you as a congregation, as your interim pastor. And it is out of that love and care that I have for you that I challenge you to be daring in your caring and in your sharing. As a congregation, try to match the daring and the courage of your new minister, Paul Anderson, who will move across country to serve you. Match his daring, his caring, with your sharing. I ask you to, cons to think about this as you consider your pledge commitment to the church. You have reasons to care. You have reasons to share. The question now is, do you have the courage to dare? Amen.